This program contains adult content. Hey, is there a God? A uh, big atheist. Really? What am I, an idiot? Come on. But yes, it would be nice if you could throw your sins and your responsibilities on someone else. But it's not true. It looks like far left lunacy. I don't believe that it's true that religion is moral or ethical. You don't need to follow anybody. It's not human intelligence. If someone doesn't value logical consistency, what logical argument are you going to give them that will demonstrate that they should? Welcome to the Godless Revolution. Today is Friday, May 18th. This is episode 206. I'm your bearded host, Dan Ellis. And I'm your two-eyed co-host, Ryan Duffy. No longer four-eyed. No. Wow. I've only got two now. <laughs> I aborted the other two. You look you look different, different. without I know. glasses. I, I keep saying that. It's not only because my eyes have red bloody marks in them, uh-huh. but it's just different not wearing glasses. Yeah. It's going to take some getting used to. Yeah. Are you still, do you still have like the phantom glass feeling? Like you're, do you oh, yeah. feel like you need to push glasses up your nose or anything yeah. all the time? When I, when I put the drops in, I try to reach underneath where I think my glasses are to like wipe the extra stuff away. And I'm like, I, there's nothing there. <laughs> Dumbass. <laughs> That's really cool, though. Like, yeah. science is awesome. It is. And and then, well, you just had this done yesterday, right? And you're yesterday. Remote, you're and, walking around without glasses. And, and my vision's and, 2020. Wow. What was it before? Uh, Bad. It was worse. <laughs> like, even, like, right here, like, in the studio, huh? like, the wall behind you, I mean, that's, what, six feet away, maybe? Uh, yeah. I wouldn't be able to read what was on any of these posters at all. Oh, wow. Without my glasses on. Yeah. And now I can read them just fine. Wow. And yeah, that's, uh, that's nice. That's really cool, man. Yeah. I'm happy for you. That's, that's cool. So, Do they give you any kind of guarantee? Like as you age, your eyes are going to change, right? So can you, well, the near, they said, uh, you know, reaching the age of 40, my, uh, close up for reading might start to go, but they have a surgery for that as well. Oh yeah. And as long as I get. Uh, an eye exam mm -hmm. every year for the next 10 years. If I have an issue where my eyes start to deteriorate or, or get worse, mm -hmm. it's free touch ups. Oh, wow. So, wow. So I'll make sure to have an eye exam every year during the next 10 years. <laughs> fancy, fancy. I need to get in and have an eye exam. I'm, I'm, I've reached the age where, uh, I need extra light to do things. Okay. Well, it just like, it used to be that if, the light was a little dim. It was fine. I could still see stuff. But now, like, if I need to find the serial number on the back of the television, I have to use a flashlight to shine on it to, okay. so that I can see it because otherwise it's just this in indistinguishable blur. I need, I need more light. And I've noticed that, uh, driving at night is not as easy as it used okay. to be. Okay. Like just Ooh. looking around and seeing shit. Don't tell a DMV that. <laughs> they don't know. They don't get that. Dude, I cannot believe how bad people's driving can get before they tell them that you can't drive anymore. Yeah. I, when Before I got my license, when I was 15 years old, my step-grandfather, who was legally blind, still had his driver's license. And he liked to have me in the car with him. And I much preferred to drive whenever we went anywhere because he was, he was terrible. Driver. Like. He, he was the kind of old person driver who would do like 10, 15 miles an hour everywhere he went and just like hug the curb the whole oh. way, you know, basically like act like he's in the, in a little, what are those like, like, like a slot car or something where, oh, yeah. you know, just if his, if his tire happened to hit the curb, then he'd correct and go a little bit to the left. You know? <laughs> it's like, holy shit. I can remember getting in the car with him one day and he's like, Oh, I, I can see a little better today. I, I, Usually I can't see the instruments, but it looks like we need oh, gas. Fuck. And I'm like, dude, you can't see the instruments when you're oh, driving that's... that are like two feet from your face. That's not good. Well, you shouldn't be down no. here driving at all. He was, he was bad. No, but the, the surgery was a little weird. Yeah. Cause I was underneath the assumption you couldn't see anything the whole time. Yeah. And the first part where they make the first, uh, to make the flap, I couldn't see anything then because. They put a suction cup on it to flatten my eye out. So I couldn't see anything then. Mm. Then they take that off and pull that flap back. I could see the tool scraping on my eye to pull the flap back. 
I couldn't feel it. Yeah. But I can see it. And I'm like, this is fucking weird. <laughs> I'm like, you're telling me to sit here and be calm and don't move. I'm watching you torture me, I'm, man. I'm Come watching, on. I'm watching you scrape my eyeball. <laughs> I, I can't not see it because you're holding my eye open. And it's really hard to not react to something <laughs> right there, right there in your eye. Yeah. And I usually have an issue with that. Then when the flap opens, everything went really blurry. They put it back, and I can see the sponge he's wiping my eye with to put the flap all back in place. And I'm like, this is, stay calm. They gave me a muscle relaxant that didn't do shit. Oh, yeah? I'm like, no, I'm still tense. I'm wired. Like, I had to think really hard. Like, at one point, the lady said, think really hard about counting each of your toes individually. Because I think she could see me tensing up. Oh, yeah? She's trying to get me to I've relax. So, because I because I go to the doctor all the time for you know, mole checks and shit like that. And I'm constantly poked and prodded and scraped and, you know, they, they take moles off for biopsy mm-hmm. and everything. I've, I've kind of developed this thing where it's almost like I step outside of myself and just kind of react to my reaction to it. Does, if that makes sense, like, like I, I, when they say, okay, it's going to be a little pinch as they go to give you the shot. I just think, I think about my reaction to the shot rather than just living in the reaction yeah. itself, if that makes any well, sense. Well, yeah, but I mean, I do that with, I can do that with a dentist or any other thing. I can just block it out. Yeah. But my eyes, I can't, which is why I can never wear contacts. I cannot block out the fact that something is touching my fucking <laughs> eyeball. <laughs> like, that's why I like doing these, eye. like yesterday when I was putting eye drops in, I would just squeeze it out in the corner of my eye, then open my eye really fast and try to shake it in. because. I would drip it and I would close my eye right before it would hit. And I'm like, yeah. I just, but I'm getting better at it. So I've been doing drops every hour almost. Well, so like yesterday I went to the dermatologist and because the last mole, you know, the last time I went in, they found a couple that were the basal cell carcinomas. So then I have to go in every three months and they'll, you know, they review the ones that they took off and then they may, you know, take off others for biopsy. So, uh, he found one on my leg that he wanted to take for biopsy. So he's like, okay, well, I'll have the, the nurse practitioner, you know, numb it up and then I'll be right back. So she handed me a form and was telling me, you know, the areas to fill out and everything. And then she took a while getting her gloves on. Then she took a little while getting the, the numbing shit mm-hmm. into the syringe. And like she had just barely finished giving me the shots when he, when he came back oh. in and he's like, okay, we ready to go. And she's like, well, I just barely finished. So you might want to wait a little while. And he's like, uh, well, did you just do it? And she's like, well, yeah, I just like, I, I just, just finished before you came in. And he's like, okay, well just let me know if you feel any pain or pressure. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And I like, I, I do it so often. It was just like, he started and I'm like, he's like, are you okay? And I'm like, I can feel it a little bit. And I think I could probably feel it a little more than I told him, but yeah. it was like, you're already there. I'm not going to have you like just he's, he's sawed halfway through the mole that he's taken off. And I'm like, yeah, just go ahead. It'll be fine. <laughs> and yeah, that, that hurt a little bit, but, <laughs> but I, but yeah, it's like, I can just, I, I, I stop paying attention to the pain itself and start paying attention to how I feel about the pain or how I react to the pain. And it's like, it takes me out of it and gives me something else to focus on. And it's like, I'm still focusing on the pain, but in a, in a one step removed, so yeah. it's different. I don't know. It's, I mean, that's, it's this weird little thing I do in my brain. Like the tattoo I had done last year on my arm was three eight hour long sessions. Uh-huh. That's eight hours of getting needles jammed in your arm. So I was able to just block that out until about hour seven and a half. Yeah. That's when things are going like, okay. <laughs> I'm done now. I'm, I'm feeling it now. Like you, when, you, <laughs> when you hit some of those spots that you hit like 20, 30 minutes ago or hit like two hours ago and then you're going back to it again. Uh-huh. Yeah, I can feel that now. It took him a couple hours to do the one on my arm. And I don't know. It it was a different pain than I was expecting. Yeah. Like I, I'd never had a tattoo before. So it was different than I was expecting at all. But then I just kind of did the same thing where I just, I realized that it kind of felt like a bee sting. Yeah. Like a really long, prolonged, <laughs> two hour long bee sting. And so just thinking about that and then just chatting with him and stuff. It was, yeah. Yeah. It was weird. Interesting. But yeah, it's just, it's just something. I don't know if, I don't know if a lot of other people do that. I've never really talked to other people about it that that's kind of how I cope with pain a lot of the time is. Yeah. I'm usually just kind of able to, to block it out in a way. Like I can still feel it, but I'm just kind of mm-hmm. trying to ignore it for the most part. Like yeah. it's like, Hey, 
well, tattoos is like, well, I put myself in this situation. Yeah. Like most other thing, like a doctor visit, it's like, well, I have no choice. So I'm just going to sit here and just kind of try to ignore it. But I've never been to, shots have never bothered me. Yeah. Besides anthrax. That Does the anthrax in. shot hurt a lot? Fuck yeah. <laughs> not when they, in, not when they, not the needle doesn't hurt. Uh -huh. It's about 10 minutes later when it starts reaching your bloodstream uh -huh. and your arm goes limp and it feels like someone just dropped a whole bunch of coals underneath your skin. Your whole arm starts burning. Ugh. Yeah. You know, when I first got that, the anthrax vaccine, they said, this is going to hurt. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So I'm all, I'm tensing up waiting for it. They shoot, they inject it. And I'm like, I wasn't bad. Oh, I wasn't too bad. No, I'm like, wait, <laughs> wait for it. Yeah. Then I'm like, oh yeah. They're like, don't try not to rub your arm or move it as just let it lay limp as much as possible. Uh -huh. Cause I don't know if the more you stimulated it, the more it would hurt. Oh man. Yeah. But, I get it yeah. working through there. Yeah. Mm. But that, that, those weren't fun. Well, tonight we have a great interview lined up yeah. with Mandisa Thomas. So should we give her a call? Let's do that. Okay. Hi, this is Dr. Hector Garcia, author of Alpha God, and you are listening to Godless Revolution. Well, if your soul is real, where is it? It's kind of in here. And when you sneeze, that's your soul trying to escape. Saying God bless you crams it back in. And when you die, it squirms out and flies away. Uh-huh. What if you die in a submarine at the bottom of the ocean? Oh, it can swim. It's even got wheels in case you die in the desert and it has to drive to the cemetery. <sighs> How can someone with glasses that thick be so stupid? Listen, you don't have a soul. I don't have a soul. There's no such thing as a soul. Rejoining the Godless Revolution podcast now. Okay, on the line we have Mandisa Thomas joining us. How are you tonight? I am doing well, thank you. We're so excited to have you on the show. I've wanted to have you on the show for so long, and I just, you know, we've got other people coming on, and other stuff comes up, and I know you're super busy, but yeah, I was I was really glad that we get to talk to you tonight. How's everything going? Everything is going well. Uh, it's a bit busy. I'm actually glad that we were able to schedule this as soon as we did. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited. So for people in the audience who don't know much about you, tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Mandisa Thomas. I am the founder and president of Black Nonbelievers Incorporated, which is based in Atlanta, Georgia. And for those of you who don't know, I fully identify as an atheist. And uh, I, it was identified some years ago that there needed to be an organization that helped bring out more black atheists and increase that support. And so that's what you've been doing with black nonbelievers? Yes, since 2011, in addition to having a family and working full time up until recently. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I know that you left your full time job to do activism full time now with black nonbelievers. Uh, didn't, I think you just left your job like last week or the week before. Is that right? Actually, my last day was March 28th, yeah. just before uh, the American Atheist Convention. Uh -huh. Oh, right, right. I was like, I knew that because I did my research beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> and if I had been paying more attention, I probably would have come to that realization also. No, I, I read all of your stuff out I on Patreon. Oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh awesome. I'm glad. Uh, no, I I wanted to say that um in addition to Black Nonbeliever, I also serve on the board for American Atheists. I'm also the chair of the board nominating committee for the Atlanta uh, excuse me, for the American Humanist Association. And I served on boards previously for the Secular Coalition for America and Foundation Beyond Belief. So I've just been kind of all over the atheist community. And you've been kicking ass wherever you go. Thank you. How is it there in Atlanta with the, the atheist community? Uh, as far as, because I, I always think of Atlanta as being a, a fairly religious area. Georgia itself is a red state. Atlanta is that blue dot, though. It's okay. very progressive here. However, 
within the black community in particular, there's still a very high religious presence and there are still quite a few of like your mega pastors here. Like Creflo Dollar, for example. Oh. Yeah, and you know the yeah, late Bishop like Eddie Long's guy. church is here. Yeah, I don't like him either. <laughs> 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 I, I, I'm still wondering if he got his. What was he? He was asking for a, a the, yeah, he the G20 a new jet. Yeah, yeah. jet a while back from his parishioners, and that that's that's the stuff I have. The the I mean, if you're a preacher, okay, but when you're one of those mega church preachers that's trying to ask for private jets and just all the money like that, and your name is Queflo Dollar, <laughs> <laughs> teaching the prosperity <laughs> right. gospel. Yeah, that's. <laughs> From what I understand, he eventually did get his jet. Uh, it was the way he, I mean, it was all a problem, but the way he did it was really problematic. Yeah, They decided to start a GoFundMe for it. Uh, he did a GoFundMe to get a jet? Yes, yes he did. <laughs> Oh man, I I feel bad for all of the people that he's duped into giving him money for this. That's just that that makes me that gives me a little sick feeling in my stomach. You know what's worse though is that his parishioners, his followers, I mean they they all many believers tend to sound like robots, but they they are particularly bad. So they actually will justify him having this jet to spread the gospel or whatever. Well, I think the, the worst part is not just them following along with it is a lot of those parishioners are probably low income people that don't have the money to actually give him, but they think if they give him money for his jet, they're going to return that money back then. And then some mm -hmm. because they donated it to him, which is horrible. Absolutely. But what needs to be understood here, particularly in the Atlanta area is that, the church he belongs to is is very, very uh, much a status symbol. Mm. And there are quite a few affluent blacks here. But um, it's just interesting to see how they will invest so much into their churches. Yeah, it, it seems weird to me that people with so little means can see somebody who obviously has a shit ton of money and doesn't actually need the money. And they'll still give it to him because they think that they've been convinced by this charlatan, this huckster, this fraud, that if they give him more money, that God is going to reward them with money. Like, why doesn't God just cut out the yeah, middleman and give give it straight to Creflo? Right. It's that prosperity gospel, which became very popular back in the 70s. Like, the more, the more you give to your church and your pastor, the more your blessings will come. Yeah, it'll be returned to you tenfold or a hundredfold or however much they they, they want to tell you that, that you'll get out of it. Um, so, right. but you grew up, uh, did you grow up in Atlanta? I did not. I am, I was born and raised in New York City. Oh, wow. Yeah, and and when, ironically, I'm a child of the 70s. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But oh, no, you're fun. fine. Please interrupt away. If, yeah, was, if ever you feel uh, like talking, just do it, because then that means I have to do much less. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I was born and raised in New York. I was born in 1976, which was a very transitional time in this country and particularly within the black community. You know, there was still a want for identity with um, Black pride and, and being Afrocentric. So there was a cultural shift during that time. And so um, I know my parents in particular wanted to, um, they wanted, they named me and my brother's African names because they wanted to connect more with the culture, if you will. So I wasn't formally raised religious. My father was. But my mom really wasn't, and neither were me and my brother. Oh wow, that's 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 pretty rare. There there are very few people or very few black people that I know that weren't raised uh, in, in any kind of religion. That seems to be something that's that's pretty rare among members of the black community. It is. It doesn't mean I wasn't indoctrinated, but I form I was not formally raised uh, in Christianity. Now I was exposed to those religions 
but I wasn't formally made to believe in them. It's interesting, the dynamic within the Black community, because similar to others, it's that even if you don't necessarily believe in Christianity or at least white Jesus, there are a lot of black who, you know, they, they put they put the black face on Jesus, you know, so they can identify better. Uh-huh. And if you remember, if you recall anything about the 50s and 60s, there were a lot of blacks who shifted to the nation of Islam. So they identified as Muslim. Mm-hmm. And so there were a lot of people who were going through those changes and transitions. And there's this notion that as black folks, that some, even if you don't believe in Jesus or the Christian God, that somehow we're, you know, connected to our ancestors and that we're, that believing in God is just inherently within us. And that's tied into the history of this country, which can be understood, which is what more people within the atheist or secular community need to understand. But yeah, the the seventies were were kind of a weird time, uh, particularly in, for black communities, because it's like, you know, after the after the fifties and sixties, you get into the sixties and, and the civil rights battles, all of that is 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 going on, and and finally ends with. You know the the end of the Jim, the end of the Jim Crow era, uh, civil rights passes, and then I think there was there was a bit of a struggle for uh, the black community to to really find its identity and and decide where they wanted to go from there. And that's you know that's when we get shows like Sanford and Son and mm-hmm. and uh, uh, mm-hmm. God, what else? Good Jeffersons and yeah. yeah, yeah. There was yeah, a sense of what is considered to be progression but remember in the in a lot of the inner cities they were still dealing with police brutality the riots uh, you know in LA and other major cities people had started really um, fighting back but then there was also the rise of you know like the gangs and stuff and you know especially within LA so yeah the 70s were a very very interesting time I honestly wish that I had been I had been like either a teenager or an adult back then because it looks like the, it's a very fascinating decade oh yeah yeah I was born in 1974 so we're we're right close to the same age and yeah, I grew up watching all of that kind of stuff, which is weird for a for <laughs> for a white Mormon boy here in Utah <laughs> to be watching all that stuff. But I loved it. I thought it was awesome. Oh, that's you know what that would be. And I I say I don't think uh, Utah gets enough credit for being credit. I mean, you think Utah, and you automatically think Mormon, <laughs> which would equal, well, you're, you're, you know conservative. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're, uh, you're not incorrect in thinking that though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the most part, I I'm an anomaly. I'm I'm kind of a, I was the weird guy, <laughs> and and I'm originally from Wisconsin, you know, and I was I, transplanted into the state, going, well, "What the fuck is this place?" <laughs> wow. <laughs> but well, you know so what's interesting you- is that even I'm sorry, <laughs> even oh, from no, whether ahead. we're from New York or Utah we still feel that same sense of being weird or being the other, like the outsider. Cause I know I felt it growing up too. Oh yeah. How long were you in New York? Until 1997. So I left when I was 21. Hmm. And what took you away from New York? Was it work or love or just wanted to get the hell out? <laughs> well, it was a combination of all three. <laughs> uh, my <laughs> husband and I, we moved down here. When I, ju- I just had our daughter, she was three weeks old when we moved. And so he transferred with his job. And so for me, it was an opportunity to see something different. New York didn't really hold anything for me anymore. I had, I went to, you know, graduate from high school. I went to college for a few years and I was still trying to find myself. And, and, you know, with being, you know, having a new family, it was just a good time for me to start over. Yeah. And you decided that Georgia was going to be the place to do that? Yeah, Atlanta in particular, because um, when I was in high school, I was in an upward bound program. 
And we actually went on a tour. We came down, traveled down here to uh, like Morehouse, Spelman, Clark Atlanta University, you know, the historically black colleges and universities. So I had already visited here before. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So when my husband asked me about the time, we weren't married, but... You know, when he asked me what I thought about moving down here, I was like, sure. It's a it's a nice area. I mean, I, I've i only been there, I think I was there like during the middle of summer and it was oppressively hot and humid. I don't know that oh, I Oh, yeah, could, absolutely. I, it's going yeah. to get hot down here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got that yeah, hot Lana, right? That's that's a thing. Yes, it's so funny. It's so funny to hear people say that. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, it does so, get hot down here. So you're there in uh, you're there in Georgia, and decide what was it that made you decide to start a, a specifically black non-believers group? I know <laughs> I saw your I saw your stuff out on Patreon for the guy uh, who tweeted at you. You know, we're already a minority. Why would you want to make a minority within a minority group? And I I kind of giggled at that. <laughs> I'm sure you were very frustrated by it, but I was like, Jesus Christ, buddy. Um, but what made you decide to start a specifically black non-believers group? Yeah. So from the time that we moved down here and ironically, I had never heard of Creflo Dollar until we moved here. I remember well, we were asked just right off the bat, like, which church do you go to? And I had never experienced that before. Mm -hmm. And and it was so odd. And over the years in getting to know people, almost everyone that we encountered went to church, which was very uncomfortable because we were we are just not that type of family. So as uh, as my daughter got older and as our family grew and as we started to get more settled. Um, really, of course, religion was never really a part of our life, but the people who we connected with, we wanted to make sure that we weren't like being disingenuous or we really didn't want anyone pushing, you know, their whole church home and church family on us. But um, in that time, I became familiar with Jeremiah Kamara, who had written um, the books Holy Lockdown and A New Doubting Thomas. And he also produced the documentary Contradiction. And so upon eventually meeting him and reassessing my my thoughts on religion, I started to become outspoken. And some of the first people who tried to discourage me was one of my mentors from elementary school and other black folks. But I found that there was a black atheist group online, which was fascinating to me because I had never seen that before. And so now I'd heard of American atheists before, like years ago, but I had just stopped considering it. But after getting to know some folks and um, once I again, once I started reassessing and reflecting and I I realized that I was indeed an atheist. I really, I wanted to start connecting with more folks. And I was told that there was a black atheist meetup, um, but that actually just never came to fruition at the time. But when I went to one of the predominantly white meetups, I had experienced what some of the other white, the other black atheists had told me they did when they attended other meetups and conventions and conferences. So when I, um, when I went to the meetup and talked with the only other black guy that was there, I said, you know, we live in Atlanta. This is a predominantly black or a highly heavily black city populated. There has mm -hmm. to be more of us out here. Like maybe they just don't know how to find others, but there, there has to be. So we decided that it was, good for us. It was necessary for us to start an organization that particularly focused on connecting Black folks on the ground. Because there were other groups online, there were ways to connect like on Facebook and on the internet, 
But actually seeing us face to face and in person, that was different. And so that's where it was born out of. You know, it really wasn't to try to separate us because just let's just be honest, most of the community is still represented by white folks. But we yeah. knew oh, yeah. that there are more of us out here. Well, do you think it's harder for someone in, in the African-American community to come out as as atheist or more difficult for them to come out as atheist as it is for a white person to come out as an atheist? Because I kind of. Uh, yes. Might, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. Well, I, that, that's kind of where I was going with. That. I figured it would be. I mean, there, there's already a, a lot of a social stigmatism with it, which is fucked up <laughs> mm-hmm. but i mean just as far as way the, the the community is and just them losing more of that community where like you said there's already a lot of white people showing up to the atheist convention so they have someone that they're already related to probably a little closer where when you show up as the only african-american person to one of those it's sometimes might be a little harder to connect because it's a it's a it's a different community altogether. Right. And I don't claim to speak for every black atheist out there because all of our experiences are different. I, and I like to I like to stress that, you know, the black experience isn't just one. However, it is like a breath of fresh air to see more blacks or people of color at these conventions because Amen. many of us have experienced a lot of saving. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to laugh at that. <laughs> because here's the thing. You know, we have this, there is this thing in the Black community of what it means to be Black. And being atheist is definitely seen as something that isn't. It's like mm. you're trying to, either trying to be like those white people. It's like you're rejecting the history, the race, the culture. And we're also rejecting the struggles and injustice that the black community went through. Mm. Yeah, it's and it's so, really. It, uh-huh. Oh yeah, no, go I'm ahead. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> well, I was just going to say it's. I, I think what a lot of white people don't understand about uh, the black community and and religion is that the churches aren't just a place of worship that's mm-hmm. that's where you built your community that's where you got your support that's where that's that was your whole life and community was through those church communities because outside of there you were ostracized and treated differently and, and badly and poorly and so your church community within the black churches was the one place of refuge where so many people could go and feel comfortable and feel free to be who they were and outside of that was was you know leaving the church was leaving your comfort zone and so yeah it is it is historically something where when black people would leave the church that they're often looked at as leaving behind their community or leaving behind their blackness and leaving behind their people to gain favor with white people yes and this, what's interesting is that there is a history of humanism atheism and free thought within the black community of course, mm-hmm. it isn't widely talked about and discussed. And you say, yeah, uh, I, I definitely agree that um, when you leave the church, you're leaving this sense of um, social structure. I do challenge, like, of course, the premise of that social structure. structure. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. for many people and for many blacks, the church was one of the only places where they could achieve a sense of prominence. Mm. Mm. as opposed to just being themselves so there was a, I mean granted yes the, the church itself did a lot of good they provided a lot of support and, and built that community of course we just you know there's just so much that goes into the dynamic of it though because if you notice again like I said before Many black churches, you know, for many black churches, it's definitely like a status symbol. Like, you know, you're judged by which church you go to. You're also judged by the clothes you wear. (laughs) And you're also judged by, you know, uh, I guess uh, maybe how good the choir is. You know, it's just, you know, the. I kind of have like an outsider's view of the of the black church because I didn't really grow up in it, but I have family members who have, 
And of course, understanding the history of it, it's a very, very interesting dynamic that many outside just really don't understand. Because we can't escape it, even though I was a formerly raised religious, you can't grow up as black in this country and and not experience it or not be exposed to it. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's 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 part of our ingrained culture. I mean it's it's something that there is no denying that there is no getting around it. It's been there forever. And mm-hmm. yeah, so so it, it, but like I say, it's something that I think a lot of, a lot of people outside that community can't really relate to very well because they don't know the history. It was, it was very cloistered, you know, and it was, it was something that, like I say, was, was a source of community and safety for people in the community. And people Absolutely. outside of that really have no idea that history. Right. They really, really don't. And, and trying to understand that emotional dynamic, the historic dynamic. Um, because we get a lot of people who ask us, a lot of white people who ask, well, I don't understand how, you know, black people will be Christian, though it was the religion that enslaved you. Mm-hmm. But when you take into consideration the role of the church as far as the building and what it, you know, and, and the role it played, you have to understand that part in addition to the subjugation. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, it's, it's still kind of a, a segregated community in a way with having predominantly like, especially here in Utah with the way the Mormon churches ran and the house I used to live in, we had three Mormon churches on my block. One wow. was the white church. One was the Hispanic church. And the other one was a mixture. And it, mm. it was odd. I could, I could drive on the street and go to one church on Sunday. All white people going into that one. Go half a block down. It's all Hispanics going into that one. I'm like, you guys are, have two churches on one block, but you segregate yourself. <laughs> right. Into the but Hispanic you know, one and the white to, one. Yeah. It, it kind of has to do with, unfortunately, the, the structure and the history collectively in this country of how mm-hmm. white folks have treated marginalized community yeah but it's uh, it, i find it kind of ironic that the one group that's supposed to be the the truth and have the answers still segregates itself right which is i don't know kind of peculiar it's to me <laughs> yeah it just it really does speak to the um the history and, and dynamics in this country mm-hmm. and how this, this quote unquote great country that we had that we're yeah. in. <laughs> Hi, this is Megan Kennedy. I'm a speaker with the Satanic Temple. You can find me on Twitter at Six Moments, and you're listening to the Godless Revolution. Shouldn't Bart and I be able to choose our own religion if we want to? Strange as it sounds, Dad. I agree with you. Well? Everyone should be able to choose their faith, just like I chose Buddhism. Buddhism? (laughs) Well, I guess lots of kids have imaginary friends. You and the Godless Revolution will be reassimilated in three, two, one. Well, I've, I don't know, I I love that you're helping to bring a more diverse, uh, a a more, you're, you're helping diversify the atheist community a bit more and bringing other minorities into it, into what has, you know, for a really long time been a a group of old white guys talking about stuff they didn't believe in. And I'm, I'm really glad to see black non-believers doing so well under your leadership and growing and bringing more people into the movement, because I think diversity is the only way that we can really push forward and make everything better. And I want to say more inclusive, but not just inclusive, but unless we can learn from each other, we're never going to really, truly advance the human condition. You're absolutely right about that. And uh, I, what I am most proud of about when, about starting Black Non-Believers is not just the increased visibility of Black atheists, but we've been able to facilitate more, um, more content, you know, more writers, more activists, more speakers uh, that people can point to as reference and, and in be in, included in these events. And we've also helped our members find their voices. 
Yeah, I think it's awesome. I, I mean, I can only imagine how hard it would be, uh, as a black person trying to, you know, enter into any of the atheist communities that are around because they are very much, uh, you know, a, 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 almost entirely white people. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe my view of it is a little more, I want to say colored, but <laughs> it would be less colored, I guess, <laughs> here in Utah where, I mean, the, the, the population of Utah is, has very, very few minorities. And so right. I, I love when I see any kind of minority get into the group. And I, and I hope I'm not too weird about it when I see somebody who, who comes to one of our events and I'm <laughs> yes! like super, and I'm like, thank you so much for coming out. It's so good to see you. Uh, what can we do for you? How can we make you come back? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, I, oh, I, ch- I challenge other black atheists to not just attend all black meetups. Because having engaged people in person in this community lets me, it, it has let me know that the, there's a difference between the online community and offline community. Now they do oh, go yeah. hand in hand, but there are a lot of folks who are able to be more of themselves or at least pretend to be themselves online. But being in, it, you know, having engaged a lot of people in person, it has allowed me to meet so many wonderful people from all backgrounds. And so I encourage, I push our members to get involved and actually participate with the with the local groups. Yeah, and absolutely. I will say I that even those... in Utah, I'm sorry, I remember when we attended the uh, Atheist Convention, that's where I first met you, Dan. Yeah, wow. yeah. And I mean, it was one of the best conventions that I <laughs> attended. Awesome. I'm glad you had a good time here in our lovely state. It's pretty out there. I mean, I understand that it is conservative and it may not be as lively or exciting as, say, like New York or Atlanta, but I really <laughs> enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, I like it here. I mean, there there's a decent nightlife here if you're into that kind of stuff. And sure, it's maybe located only in salt lake city <laughs> but you know that's that's where i am so it makes it easy for me um but i i just like i said I, I love when we get other people coming out to it and you're absolutely right it is really really important for people to interact with groups not just online but in actual meet space you know i i, I see comments from people all the time there's a there's a large uh facebook group here in utah that originally was controlled by atheists of Utah, and it just got to be way too time consuming to sort out all of the arguments and to police it and do all the administration for that. Mm-hmm. We, it was taking way too much time away from us doing things in, in, in the real world and, and accomplishing anything out there because we were constantly dealing with online arguments between people who had never met and would never talk to each other the way that they talk to each other online if they were to meet in real right. life. So, right. Yeah. So we, we turned that over to just other people who are in the group and, and they're administrating that now. But I am constantly still frustrated years later, years after atheists of Utah is not in control of that group or anything because the, the group name now is Utah atheists for the Facebook group. And there's a lot of really great people in the group, but there's also a lot of fucking assholes in there who comment mm-hmm. on shit and, and make it an unpleasant place to be sometimes. And then I see comments from people who have never come to an event from atheists of Utah, the nonprofit organization. And they'll, they'll make comments in the Utah atheists group about how much they just would never want to meet anybody. And that they, you know, they don't want to have anything to do with atheists of Utah because it's a bunch of assholes. Mm-hmm. And it's like, Hey, this isn't atheists of Utah. This is a Facebook group called Utah atheists. And B people don't interact this way when they're talking to each other face to face, come out and, and meet some of us. We're I, I'm sure even the person you're having a disagreement with is probably a decent person in real life. They're just an asshole online. Right now, we will. I will say though that there are a lot of atheists in person who do exhibit their social awkwardness. Oh yeah, you know, we yeah. Talk about these, yeah. There are a lot these, of really, really awkward people. <laughs> yes. 
we talk about these guys who uh what is it the, the incels now the one the involuntary celibate uh, yeah yeah, yeah the, the guys the, the guys who think that you know all women are just like um intentionally like not sleeping with them or but there are a lot of people who disguise their shitty behavior as being weird oh yeah which is another yeah, i've problem. seen that for sure too yeah because we'll have you know well like let's say for example i'll take myself for example you know when i speak on issues you know that pertain to the black atheist community there always has to be that white person who for one who gets defensive not all white people and then all right right <laughs> And then there's always some sort of, you know, the the ones who have to always be, I guess, like technical about everything, you know, and will want to go on and on and on and talk. And I understand it can be exciting and exhilarating, but sometimes it's like you got to know when to just like pull back and stop. (laughs) So what can we do to help encourage um, uh, more minorities coming out to our events. What can we do to make them more welcoming? How can we help do that here locally? And then how can we also help black non-believers? Oh, okay, good. That's a, that's the, no, uh, that's probably, uh, that might take about a good couple of minutes for me to respond to. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the first thing you can do is for one, you know, when, when y'all mentioned, you know, the, when y'all, when y'all mention that y'all have people of color who come to the meetings, you know, and y'all are excited and that's great, and y'all ask, what can we do? When y'all are, when people are told what they can do, it's really good to be consistent and follow up. Like, if there are, like, communities of color there, if there are events that you think might be good to participate in, it would be good to do that. And also, if you have events, like if uh, in in the area, um, you know, in, invite us out. Um, I am very, since I left my job, and I know, I know, Dan, you mentioned that you uh, read my post on Patreon about why I quit the job, which I hope was very entertaining. And I, I, <laughs> I, I have to write more on that, too. <laughs> It was indeed, yeah. I have more questions about that, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very, very interesting. Almost 10 years there. But um, also, when you attend other events, even if they aren't in your state, if you think, please suggest me and other Black atheists as speakers. And I'm also open to traveling to Utah again, you know, and coming to speak to your groups. Or if you if you think that there is an event like a combined event where you think there will be people of color there and you can and y'all can benefit from having one of us there, please let me know. There really that would aren't be too awesome. many places yeah. that are too far. I'm I'm pretty. I know there are some people who think that some places are too far for them to travel. I'm not one of them. <laughs> So I'm willing to do whatever I can, you know, to help facili- facilitate this because someone we all we still have to do this. And so we talked a little bit about you leaving your job recently um, and you did that to become uh, an activist full time. Um, I know that there's also some some family issues that you leaving your job um, makes a little bit easier. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, uh, absolutely. My husband has sickle cell anemia. And ironically, right when I left the job was when there was a succession of um, issues that he that he experienced that let me know that this was the right time for me to leave. For those of you who aren't aware of what sickle cell anemia is, it is a genetic disease that predominantly affects black folks. And um, it it is a blood it is a blood disease which causes other health issues along the line. And uh, unfortunately, for um, people who have it, um, it 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 makes their condition it, it it's debilitating for them. And so, um, 
And so it's been very challenging to have now a family of three children and have been working and really having discovered this passion for and within for for atheism and, and being in the community, which I wouldn't trade for the world. But it, there came a time where I had to give the job up, not just for the activism, but also for the sake of, you know, my, my family, too. And uh, it's very, very interesting. My husband really doesn't like to talk about his illness, which kind of bothers me because I just I love talking about everything. Not saying that we should. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we should just talk about every single thing, but having dialogue around these situations is really, really helpful. Well, yeah, especially for people who don't really know what's going on or or what sickle cell anemia is. I mean, I I don't have a, a great idea of what it is or or what happens, but in reading your post, it sounds like uh, it it is a disease that cuts your life short it it has a lot of health complications and you know yeah. while you're still around and and it just is a progressive thing that just gets worse and worse it it really does um the the mo- the, the primary thing that happens with sickle cell um patients is that they have what's called crises is that sometimes the blood will clot in in certain areas of the body and so what tends to happen is that it causes a lot of pain and it also causes them to be immobile. It could for a while. Like, so there are times where my husband has not been able to walk. You know, I've had to, I've had to help him to the bathroom. I've had to help him around the house. And so uh, it could be for like a few days or to a week. Sometimes they have to stay in the hospital for a few days in which in this past month he was just in the hospital. Because he had a stroke, he had another stroke, and that's unfortunately ah, uh, that's a that's a part of the per- of the disease is that they eventually start having strokes. So it's been it's been quite the um, experience. Um, I'm not sure sometimes how to put it in words <laughs> because you know people ask me how I do <laughs> this, and sometimes I'm just like hell, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's got to be hard. I mean, you're you're running an organization, well, and you were working full time. You're doing speaking engagements, having to try to take care of a family. I mean, I I work a regular job and do the podcast and and do Atheists of Utah stuff and stuff for American Atheists, and I know that just that is a shit That's ton a of fucking work, yeah, and I can't yeah. imagine. Yeah, I can't imagine, you know, on top of that, having to to deal with a debilitating illness in the family and 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 all of the things that, you know, that are going that all of the things that make that that makes much more difficult as well, because of the time that it takes away in trying to deal with that and and in trying to deal with taking care of your loved one and and seeing them deteriorate and then just the, the toll that it takes on you mentally as well. Yes, it has been. uh, It has been a challenge, but the the. We're very fortunate in that my husband is a federal employee. He's been working for the federal government now for about 26 years. So he's able to, prov- he's able to provide a, a very good foundation for, for the family as well as for me to be able to do what I have been doing for the past seven years. But it is still, um, it is still very daunting and exhausting to have dealt with. And then for it to be getting to, it's hard to get to this point now. I mean, we already knew that this was going to happen, but now we're, we're being pragmatic about it. We're being practical and just making sure that we have everything in place for it for the next couple of years. Yeah, that's. I, I, I don't envy the situation that you're in. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that that's. That your that your family's having to go through all of that. I know that that's got to be really really difficult, and it it's and I want to say too that I that I had no idea any of that was happening until fairly recently. So you've you've done a great job in separating all of that from your more public life, mm-hmm. and you know it's I know I know a lot of people who have in the past used things like that as a crutch or that, or that they're, 
you know, they're trying to garner sympathy and everything. And I, I had absolutely no, I, I've known you for four years now and had no idea that any of that was going on because it's not something that you use to garner sympathy or anything. Right. And I, the one thing that I've never wanted anyone to do was to feel sorry for me or sorry for us. Hell, even with the atheism, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me because I'm proud of being an atheist. I'm proud of my community. You know, I'm proud of the history and, um, and the perseverance that blacks have um, had to overcome. And, and, you know, and, but I think sometimes it hurts us when we don't speak about it, when people don't know, because unfortunately, especially for black women, you know, we, we have to hold, uh, we have to hold a world on our shoulders, Mm -hmm. which is killing us. (laughs) Yeah. And I have to say that even for my upbringing, even though I was a formerly raised religious, I, um, you know, I actually had to overcome an abusive upbringing. And so I can say that that has actually prepared me for my life with my family and being able to do so many different things at one time. But at this time, it is just I, something had to give, you know, it, I had to say enough is enough. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think I think you made the right choice. I mean, you've got to take care of yourself and take care of your family. Um, I think it's amazing that you're still able to do all of that while maintaining your role with black nonbelievers and still kicking ass. Uh, do you have any recent news about non uh, or about BN and what's going on there? Any upcoming events or exciting stuff? Absolutely. The main thing that I'm excited about is our convention at sea in November. There's information about that on the homepage of our website. And um, we have a couple of local events coming up, our annual barbecue potluck in the Atlanta area. Um, We just established a chapter in Cincinnati, Cincinnati, Ohio, where the American Atheist Convention is going to be next year. So I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited um, about it. And yeah, I I was just going to say, I'm really excited about it because I'm really hoping that that means that there will be a whole lot more people of color at the convention next year. Yeah. And I was actually very, very glad to see the number that was at this year's convention. Oh, yeah. And I'm I'm happy to say that there were more who people who came out because we were there, which I appreciate. And I always love, you know, the American Atheist Conventions. Um, you know, they're always very fun and and pretty lively. I've always enjoyed them ever since the first one I attended back in 2011. But I do look forward to seeing more people and more people of color there next year. I'm Bryce Barkenagel. Have you ever wondered if Joseph Smith was drugging the early Mormons? Turns out it might be possible when you have a fantastic congregation that is witnessing angels floating around in the rafters and think that the temple is on fire and they're running out in the snow and writhing around on the ground naked. Yeah, as it turns out, drugs might be the best explanation. Be sure to check out my Sunstone Symposium presentation on the Joseph Smith Entheogen Theory by punching that into any YouTube browser. And thank you so much for checking that out, and be sure to check out the Naked Mormonism podcast. This is The Godless Revolution. So does this theory of evolution necessarily mean that there is no God? No, of course not. It just says that God is an impotent nothing from nowhere with less power than the Undersecretary of Agriculture, who has very little power in our system. <laughs> it's a high... No, I... Thanks for listening. Now back to the show. One of one of my favorite things about the American Atheist Convention is being able to hear you speak at the convention. Uh, your your talk this year I thought was awesome. <laughs> it was it was great. I Yay! Just, I, I loved- and you weren't distracted by the dress. <laughs> <laughs> I saw your I saw your post about that, and I'm like. Wait, she wasn't wearing underwear? I didn't, I didn't, that's like not a thing that I even noticed. (laughs) So, so for our listeners, so for our listeners, what, what happened there? 
Okay, so um, I decided to have a dress specially made. Not just a dress. I also had leggings specially made with uh, the BN logo and the slogan. And so when I was told that that I'll be speaking and that I would be right before Hugh Laurie, mm. I said, you know what? I have to turn this out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna wear any underwear. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I had I wore my custom made dress that I had ordered, which I was probably gonna wear anyway, regardless of where I was on the program. But there were some people who uh you know you know Brie, you know Bridget, you know we love her to death. <laughs> oh yeah, I fucking love Brie. Yeah, and so on her Instagram page there was this guy there who I didn't even realize that he had said something until he tagged me in a comment 18 hours later. He went on and on about how he said that I didn't have one in the underwear. He was wondering what was the point of that. <laughs> he was glad that he didn't bring his son. And even if I oh. wore nude colored underwear, what was the point? <laughs> so is this did is does he trying to say that he was at the convention and he saw you on stage and noticed that you weren't wearing any underwear? That is exactly what he was saying. He said he was close to the front and when I hugged Victor when I went on stage, he claimed he could see everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was sitting I I think I w if I wasn't in the front row, I was like maybe two or three rows back, I didn't notice anything when you hugged Victor. Yeah. I mean, I was like, yeah, I know that it was pretty, it was pretty short, but that's, I mean, it wasn't that short where you could see underneath because even if he did see underneath, he'd be lying about the fact that I wasn't wearing underwear, which even if I wasn't, who gives a shit? <laughs> 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 well, I, I guess, I guess, yeah, maybe we should settle the controversy because I don't know if you were or not. Were you, in fact, going commando? <laughs> Actually, I did. You know, I, um, I did have one underwear underneath. Which is oh. so funny. I know, right? Like, boo. <laughs> but no, I absolutely was wearing underwear underneath that dress. But there was another woman who wrote into our website and said that she was appalled at the way I was dressed and that it's bad for our image and perception. Oh. What What was her specific complaint? She was, she said, uh, she said that I went out of my way to be unprofessional and that she's sure that I was a nice person, but the way I was dressed was just like not good at all. I don't, I, what? M modesty police are still well and alive in the atheist community, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Some holdovers yes. from their religion. <laughs> Yes, I mean, the Mormons would have been happy you had sleeves and it covered your shoulders, so you would have been yeah. fine here in Utah. Yeah. <laughs> but but apparently it didn't go to the ankles. Uh, right, no, no. You can see it, a shin. <laughs> <laughs> and I think sometimes, though, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, I was, you know, for me, because I'm a, I'm a fuller figure woman, you know, I have big boobs, you know, I'm not, I'm not skinny. But you know, there's this thing that we're not supposed to, we're not, we're, we're not supposed to show off our bodies no matter what. Yeah. Well, because Fuck those, them. because those guys right. just can't control themselves when they get you sexy ladies around them. Right. Right. <laughs> They'll just turn into monsters around you. <laughs> I think that just kind of exposes that they're monsters anyway. Exactly. You know, I mean, people think that. That um, perceptions, or that when you're fully dressed, that you aren't uh, that you aren't capable of, of doing bad shit. <laughs> we see the we see the president in suits all the time, and he does bad shit like every fucking day. Yeah, you know. Yeah, you know? <laughs> oh man.
Well, it's been an absolute delight having you on the show. We're going to have to have you back again because I love talking to you and I love seeing you and getting great hugs. You give great hugs. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dan. It, <laughs> <laughs> if if uh if people want to get in touch with you have you on their show do whatever uh uh how can they get in contact with you and where should they go for more information about you absolutely well um i am on twitter at my handle is mandy0904 i uh my patreon is um it's patreon.com backslash mandy salativa uh, you won't be able to search it because uh, it has adult content. You can also write me at the Black Nonbelievers website at blacknonbelievers.org. I am on Facebook. Uh, you type in Mandisa Latifa Thomas. Um, just pretty much anywhere. <laughs> 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 well i will be sure to include links to all of those in the show notes for this episode again this is episode 206 oh, is wow. that right? uh, i'm fucking confused let me see 200 yeah this, yeah, this is 206 yeah season five wow <laughs> five years and i'm just now coming Been on doing this show actually Dan, shame on you I know he's an asshole. Yeah, I'm a giant (laughs) fucking dick, man. (laughs) But we will definitely have you on the show again sometime in the near future. Um, Thank you so much for coming on. This has been awesome. I've I've wanted to chat with you for a while. Awesome. Well, I am very glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you again so much. I fucking I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck with everything. And if you need anything, if there's anything you think of, you think of that I can possibly help with. Please let me know, and yeah, I look forward to talking to you more and, and working with you more in the future. Awesome, thank you, Dan. Love you too. Thank right. you, thank you once again for having me on. Okay. My pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye. She's so fucking cool. Yeah, the, the, the interview might have gone better just over, over Skype. She's <laughs> just so fucking cool, though. Yeah. I, I love Mandisa. I, I love I love talking to her. I, she's just she's fun. She's warm. Like I just. I don't know. I, she makes other people feel good to be around her. She's, she's yeah. just one of those amazing people that when you're around them, you just feel happier and warmer and more love. She's just fucking awesome. Well, I felt, I felt a little, you know, how do you tackle the questions of race? Yeah. Being a white person, I'm like, I, I, I have nothing to talk from for, from a, any <laughs> thing close to any kind of marginalized minority experience besides being an atheist but even growing up, growing up in the midwest it wasn't a fucking big deal yeah so i've been fortunate in life to have that so i'm like i've got i don't have a starting point and so i'm just kind of like well you know it's, it's on my just trying to figure out the the right question sometimes like well is this in, a, in an appropriate question or is this okay to ask <laughs> i think i've just always I think already, i've always been part of the counterculture like when I was young, I, I sought out relationships with people of color and, and the kids who were different in school. Like, well, I didn't want to hang out with people who were just like me because I'm fucking boring, man. I wanted to learn from yeah. other people who were totally different than me. Well, and that's growing up in the Midwest. You don't really have the opportunity either. Dude, I, I grew up in Utah. True. <laughs> I had one African American student or one African student in my class. Uh-huh. He wasn't even, he was from Africa. Yeah. He was a foreign exchange foreign student. Foreign exchange student. The only black kid in the entire high school was a foreign exchange student from Africa. Oh my God. I remember, uh, let's see, I had to have been in, I think I was a sophomore in high school and in my honors English class. Yeah. I was a fucking book nerd. Yeah. <laughs> but in my honors English class, we had an assignment. I can't even remember exactly what the assignment was, but it was, you know, we, we basically created a survey for our classmates and had them do stuff. And mine was on race issues mm. because it's always been something that I've, that I've been fascinated by and have wanted to always learn more about. I mean, I was the kid growing up. I, I watched like Sanford and Son and fucking different strokes and the Jeffersons and all of the, all of the black sitcoms that were on TV. I watched those. I fucking love rap and hip hop and jazz. Well, not so much jazz, some jazz, 
the the really weird eclectic See, stuff was, where it just sounds like people are tuning uh, the, their yeah, instruments. That's it? not for me. But like the scat stuff. Is that what you call it? Scat jet? Like where it's no, well, scat scat is a uh, <clears throat> scat. If you're not talking about poop, is... no, I'm not talking about poop. I'm talking about the the, <laughs> the music styling where it's it's more it's, it's more the lyrical styling of it, isn't it? Where like the well, yeah, that's so scat usually refers to the to the lyrics where yeah. they're just you know zebop do that yeah yeah that that kind of stuff. But it's, but, a, it's a jazz genre isn't it um maybe i don't know i'm not all that familiar with jazz okay. i just know i don't like the type of jazz where it sounds like they're just tuning their instruments there's not there's no that's where i thought like, like with that, that, that scat style can... where everybody's like hey we're all just gonna improv something and see if it makes sense <laughs> yeah that's i don't dig that kind of jazz no i i i like a lot of other kinds of jazz but i've always liked uh counterculture and here in utah counterculture would be anything that was not Mormon. Not Mormon, <laughs> not white. Yeah. So, you know, growing up, most of my friends were, were people of color. And, uh, I've, like I said, I've always been into rap music and minority mm-hmm. shows and movies. And that's, that's always been like, if I, I've always felt like I, I was born in the wrong skin, kind of <laughs> like I, I love other cultures. Mine just seems so plain. And well, you are and, ginger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm the whitest guy around, and it just maybe it was just the attraction, the the opposite attract kind of thing that it was. There was a huge draw for me because it was so different, so extraordinary to what I had encountered in my life to that point that I just, oh, I was like, ah, I'm gonna gobble all this. Well, up. This is awesome. Were you rebellious against the religious culture at the same time? At uh, age or no? Uh, not when I was younger. Oh, okay. Not when I was younger. I mean, I still, when I was younger, I, I was watching all that stuff and listening to that kind of music, but I wasn't really against the religion until I was older. Like, like I didn't know if that would play a part in, like, I mean, your, it never your... made any sense to me. I always thought it was bullshit, yeah. but I wasn't really like, religion is bullshit. And, you know, it's, it's a terrible, it's not a force for good in our community and, and in our lives. It's, it's usually, you know, it usually ends up being a bad thing. I, I didn't come around to that line of thinking until I was older, like, I don't know, in my late teens, early 20s. See, and I always thought I should have grown up in, like, the 1940s. Oh, yeah? So I can just wear a three-piece suit, drink alcohol all day long and not have it be an issue. <laughs> Top hat. Yeah? Yeah. Go to work at the factory, yeah. come home. Oh, no, I'd be, I'd be like a madman type of person. Oh, do do ads and stuff. Do ads, just drinking all day, wearing a fancy suit. <laughs> like suits nowadays, I'm like, I don't like those suits. I like what when I see like a suit, I'm like, I like old suits. I like the way people used to always wear the old suits with the hat. Like that was yeah. normal everyday wear. I'm like, that's interesting to me. Yeah. Suspenders. Come on. <laughs> you don't have to worry about a belt. Come on. No. <laughs> uh, Damp is wearing suspenders around the office all the time lately. In a in a in a hipster way or just he thinks it's no it's he, because he he does temple fit. work apparently oh. on thursdays and that requires suspenders <laughs> well he dresses up well it's funny to me it because, gets your pants up faster so when you pull him down to have a young parishioner help you out well it seems like really fucking whoop. stupid right because he he comes to work dressed up in like a suit to do temple work, but when he gets to the fucking temple, he's got to change into his temple clothes. So yeah, he changes into the baker outfit. Yeah, it's fucking stupid. Like, so you dress up to go to the temple to get undressed and dress into something yeah. else. What Just, the fuck is? Well, he's got to pass through the gates, and God's watching. Oh right, yeah. I don't know. It's I, just I don't know. everything about that guy just drives me fucking nuts. <laughs> oh my god. We should. I, w- I wish we knew someone that could make like really good cartoons that we could just make damp cartoons. <laughs> and he tries so hard to be my friend, and I'm like, dude, it's never gonna happen. Like, I don't like you on a on a basic level. I don't fucking like you. Do you, you. think it's because he wants to convert you? Like, you're his like. You get me into the highest celestial heaven if I can convert your ass. <laughs> I think it's because everybody else just placates his stupid bullshit okay. and I don't. And he's trying to win me over. And I'm like, no, I still think what you're doing is bullshit. <laughs> like the way you talk to people, the way you interact with people, the things you say, the things you think, the things, everything about you is it's- detestable to me pretty much. So it's just never going to fucking happen. <laughs> he came. So, oh, dude. So. I was in the office yesterday and you know, I've been sick and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Taking all kinds of fucking cold medicine and shit. 
And I had a hard time sleeping Wednesday, have to get up super early to be in the office Thursday. So I'm fucking tired. And then I'm on cold medicine on top of that. So I'm drowsy because of it. And I'm sitting at my desk and I'm waiting for this install to happen because we're up, we're upgrading a piece of software work and it's been a piece of shit. The whole, the whole install thing that they're trying to do is bullshit. It's not fucking working. And I'm sitting at my desk and I'm waiting for it. And I've got my headphones in and I got these really cool new fucking headphones that are totally wireless. So it's just these earbuds that go oh, in nice. your ear. Like, like the iPhone ones? Uh, much better. Okay. Like the iPhone ones just sit in your ear. Yeah. These, these like go into your ear canal okay. and block it out. And, and then it has like, they're just really cool. You can mix in outside sound. So like I can still hear everything that's going on around oh, me. Those are the I ones want, that you had on the table totally last week. Block weren't it they? Out. Yeah, I, th- I remember you had some new headphones saying like, that you oh yeah, yeah, gotten. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're totally, they're badass. I fucking love them. They're so comfortable. And anyway, so I was, I had those in and I was listening to podcasts and I'm waiting for this install and I'm tired and I close my eyes and I start to drift off a little bit. And he comes over into my fucking cubicle, <laughs> which we've talked about several times. I fucking hate. Like, if you've got a question for me, send me a message. So he comes wandering over into my cubicle, and I've got my eyes closed with my headphones in, listening to shit. And he fucking grabs me and is like, Dad! Scared the shit out of me. And I was like, oh, I, oh, I wanted to punch him so fucking bad. Like, it was really close. I, oh, my God. But I was just like... I like I he startled me and I woke up and I turned and he could see murder in my eyes I think because he backed out of my cubicle really quick and he's like sorry I didn't mean to scare you and I'm like what <laughs> do you want coming into my cubicle uh, right now and he's like I can't get the install to work I've done this and that and I'm like you're not special <laughs> everybody's having the same problem well, what have you done? I'm like it's you it's can like, see it's still right having, here it's, it's having the same problem not I'm doing shit fucking waiting for it. Yeah, well, it might do something. Let's see. And he just ah! fucking st- and I'm like, no, nope. <laughs> no, nope. I've got other stuff to do. I'll let you know how it goes. And just so, how much trouble would you get in if you got a a paintball claymore mine? A paintball claymore mine? Oh yeah. What is that? So it's a little, it's a little uh, like horseshoe shaped tube. Uh huh. You put paint in the top end of it. Uh huh. Then the bottom end of it, you put a, a little mini CO2 cartridge. Uh huh. Then you, it's got a spring in there that's got a little pin. Uh huh. Then you put a string attached to the pin across your doorway. So when he walks in and kicks the, <laughs> the string, it pulls the pin, hitting the CO2 cartridge, spraying the paint all over him. Ah. They're not really loud. It's kind of more of a, yeah, but a good spray of paint. I'd, I'd probably be in trouble for that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just, I don't like him and I can't seem to get that through his thick fucking skull. <laughs> like, just leave me the fuck alone, dude. Uh, <sighs> it still would be fun to booby trap your office. Oh yeah. Oh, well, well, yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. And when I worked at AT, when I worked at AT&T, we had this, uh, they had a program there called, um, what was it? World of, world of ideas or something like that. Okay. And so they had these little, these round paper things that you could fill out with ideas oh. for the business to incorporate. And if it was a really good money saving idea, they gave you, you gave you money. Yeah. They gave you like a 10% cut of yeah. the projected savings yeah. of this idea or whatever. And it's like, well, you wouldn't have been saving anything before. Why don't you give me like at least half of yeah. it for however long, because you're still going to get half of that. Yeah. And then af- after the time that you, anyway, so they had this world of ideas thing. And one of, <laughs> one of the guys that I worked with was, was having a really shitty day. And he, so his, he filled out one of the, he filled out one of the world of ideas and he's like, Hey, we're AT and T. We control like all the phone lines and we make phones for everybody. Why don't we create a system where, if somebody calls us and they're being stupid, we have a button <laughs> that we can push and it gives them a nice little shock in the ear. <laughs> and they fucking, so they reviewed his, they reviewed his thing. And he, of course it was a total joke, right? Yeah. So they reviewed his thing and they called him into HR and brought in a counselor to fucking talk to him. Oh, it was hilarious. Oh. He was like, I guess I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Cause they brought somebody in from HR to talk to him and assess his mental health. And he's like, it was a fucking joke, people. Come on. 
we were we were shooting in an old cafe uh, up in Idaho, uh, and there's an old suggestion box sitting there. Uh, and the place has been closed for like two or three years. Hmm. So I'm like, I wonder if there's any suggestions in the suggestion box. <laughs> and I open it up, and it's all napkins. And several of them had, why don't you get pieces of paper for your suggestion box so we don't have to write on napkins? <laughs> Here's a good idea. Why don't you make it easier for people to submit suggestions to you? And it was kind of funny when I'm looking at it, I'm like, yeah, all these suggestions are written on napkins. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, they never checked the suggestion box. <laughs> uh, well, should we do some newsy stuff? Okay. All right, then. Hi, this is Yvette Dontremont, a.k.a. The Cybabe, and you're listening to Godless Revolution. You can find me at Cybabe.com, at my Twitter account, at The Cybabe, and if you've hunt really hard, you can find me at Pornhub. I dare you. I'll keep it short and sweet. Family. Religion. Friendship. These are the three demons you must slay if you wish to succeed in business. When opportunity knocks, you don't want to be driving to the maternity hospital or sitting in some phony baloney church or synagogue. Thank you to everybody who has rated the show on iTunes and Stitcher and are following us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And to all our Patreon patrons, you make the show possible. <sighs> I'm going to catch you while you're putting drops in your eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just weird because I, I can see it coming. Oh, don't cry about it. I know. Don't cry. The weird. It's like it's like lube. <laughs> I lube because it's it's like when I like wipe it off, like it's it's actually like slick. Oh yeah. Probably feels nice when you put them in. It does because they say just keep your eyes extra moist for the next three weeks. Yeah. So. Huh. Well, we have some stories that we're going to be talking to y'all about this evening. Oh yeah. Um. And I want to make sure that this is actually fucking god damn it. No, it's just really zoomed in or zoomed out. It's not going anywhere. Yeah, it is. Is it? It's showing it on, on an hour and five minute time scale. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah, it's just really zoomed out. I have fucking technical issues tonight. Jesus. We're stupid. It's. <laughs> We've had some issues this <laughs> evening, which sucks because I wanted that. To go so well, and we had some technical problems, but we'll get those sorted out. It'll yes. Be, it'll be fine. It'll be fine, and we'll have Mandisa back on again sometime soon, because she's a lot of fun to talk to. I yeah. Love, I love talking to her. Uh, we've got to start out this evening. So let me, let me, let me back up just a little bit. We have a lot of shit to do, uh, tomorrow, Ryan and I. Ryan's doing videos. You're doing, oh yeah, for the mascot. The mascot miracles foundation. So yeah. getting up early because the car ride starts at 7 a.m. And you got to drive from here, here back to your place and then home, drive, then back, drive here. back yeah. down here. So we want to get Ryan out of here a bit early tonight. And then I have shit to do at the Utah Pride Center tomorrow also for atheists of utah participating in the pride festival i have to go to a vendor orientation meeting early in the morning yeah fuck them on a saturday god damn it uh so we won't have an extra or separate patreon section tonight but our patrons will get the episode before normies yeah yeah normies (laughs) so uh sorry it'll be a little bit shorter this evening for those of you who like the really long episodes but we're, we'll be recording again. We, we, Ryan's schedule is shifting, so we'll be shifting our recording dates to Monday. So we're recording tonight, and then next week we're recording on Thursday, on Thursday with Shannon, and then the following week on Monday. So I'm going to have like three episodes piling up to get edited and out to all of y'all. And uh, it's editing is a lot of work. Like for every hour that we, re- that we record, it's two to three hours of editing. So... Uh, yeah, it's a lot of work behind the scenes for that kind of stuff. Uh, and I have a, a life that I like yeah. to lead outside of activism and the show. <laughs> I, I, I tell people the same thing for video editing. Like, Hey, well, how much do you charge for video editing? Well, it's, I'm on the cheap end of like $25 an hour. Uh-huh. Like, Oh, well, it's just a three minute video. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the point. You sent me five hours worth of video to go through for a three minute video. So, uh huh. That takes time. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of work to get all of this stuff right. I'm, I'm constantly amazed at the great quality content that people put out on YouTube all the time. Because oh, yeah. 
that like audio editing is hard enough, but you throw in the yeah. extra layer of video on top of that. And I'm not very good at that. You're much better at that than I am. But Well, luckily with video editing uh-huh. and the audio in it, uh-huh. sometimes you can mask bad audio with a musical backtrack behind it. <laughs> yeah, right. When the audio is shit, you just kind of play a medley. A little bit. A little, like, little melody oh. in the background. It's like, fuck, it's, it's echoey with the audio. If we did, we're in a bad location. We just throw some soft music in the background behind it because it's going to have music in there anyways to uh-huh. help drive it. And it helps mask it sometimes. <laughs> oh, that's a good tip. <laughs> I'll have to remember that. Uh, but, so... We have four stories that we'll cover for you this evening, starting with this dumb motherfucker. Who, uh, surprise, surprise, he's a GOP congressman. Yeah. Who uh, wants to know if rocks are causing sea levels to rise. And by the way, before you all ask, yes, I am a doctor. <laughs> uh, yeah. So apparently this guy thinks that just through natu- natural erosion, you know, when waves crash against the shore or rivers run out to the ocean, that all the silt and everything that they're carrying is what is actually contributing to the rising sea levels, not global Global. temperatures rising. Hey, Dr. Duffy, you're not answering my question again. Mm -hmm. I'm conceding for the moment that there has been ice meltage compared to what it was three million years ago, whatever, since that's the time frame you use. I'm Whatever, since that's the time frame you yeah. use, I'm guessing this guy is probably a young Earth creationist. Yeah. Like, I use a 6,000 year time frame, but whatever. We'll whatever talk time about, frame. We'll talk you about use. yours. It may seem like a weird, mystical idea of a billion year old planet, but we'll just, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll entertain that for now. And you'll also have to pardon me. I'm still getting over being sick, so that you may hear some coughing in the background every now and then. I'll try to keep that to a minimum, but. Hey, man, if you got a cough, you got a cough. I can't hey, help it. I'll least, try to make it quiet. At least I can see. <laughs> um, yeah, this guy's a dummy. I'm asking another question that is, what other factors have caused the sea levels to rise relative to dry land? Does anyone else have any? I mean, you, okay, in particular, you, Dr. Duffy, you said but, that they're going to be massive. Isn't that the word that you use in your uh, remarks? Massive sea level rises. Don't you think if you're going to have that kind of statement, you ought to have some idea as to what all the causes of sea level rises have been? Sure. And and if you're you're referring to ground subsidence, uh, that is a factor in some regions. Okay. What else? That's one. (laughs) So now we've gotten two. What else? It's like he's trying to educate the scientists. Uh, uh, The levels of sea level rise that arouse my concern. I'm just asking for factors. I I was not asking for your prioritizing of one over the other. But you've mentioned two. What else? Well, Jesus Christ, if you want to go that route, uh, fucking space debris raining down on Earth is, uh, I'm sure going to cause some, some level of well, sea rise. My concern is people that go to the beach, drink too much, walk out in the water and urinate. Oh. That's all hundreds of gallons of piss <laughs> every year going into the ocean. Dude, think about all those fish that are peeing in the water. True. <laughs> not only do, not that not only do we have the issue of sea level rising because of urine, uh-huh. it's also adding to the salinity of the water, which is going to kill off sea life. Uh. So it's not because the water is getting warmer. There's too much piss in it. <laughs> Those are all that I know of. What about erosion? What about erosion? Yeah, that's a thing, that's, right? That's something I learned in high school. I mean, it's like dropping a grain of sand in a cup of water. Yeah. <laughs> Look how much it rised. <laughs> Every single year that we're on Earth, you have huge tons of silt deposited by the Mississippi River, by the Amazon River, by the Nile, by every major river system, and for that matter, creek, all the way down to the smallest systems. And every time you have that soil or rock, or whatever it is that is deposited into the seas, that forces the sea levels to rise because now Ooh, you've got, I got a less question space for him. in those oceans. Was that? Do you think he would believe that the Grand Canyon was actually carved out by water? Then, mm, I don't. Know. Well, sure. It well, yeah, it was, but it was after the Great Flood. Oh, it was after the flood okay. for Noah's Ark, the Noachian flood. That's when the Grand I guess Canyon I was guess he would out. still have that argument. 
got less space in those oceans uh, because the bottom is is moving up. Um, <laughs> what about? It's, it's like there's a magical dirt elevator. The ocean is twerking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I'm, I'm pretty the, sure the that white cliffs of Dover, uh, California, uh, where you have the waves crashing against the shorelines, and time and time again, you're having the cliffs crash into the sea. The All of that displaces water, which <laughs> forces it to rise, does it not? I'm pretty sure that on human timescales, those are minuscule uh, effects. <laughs> minuscule effects. Yeah. And you know that he wishes he could have followed that up with, you dumb motherfucker. motherfucker. <laughs> well, so so here, here's my big thing with that one. So he says, the sea level is rising because the ocean floor is, is collecting shit and it's pushing the water up. Yeah. Uh, displacing all of that water. Well. But that would make it doesn't have any room because the ocean floor is rising up, so the water's got to go but up. Then the sea level would still be at the same depth, uh, instead of increasing, uh, because it's just pushing itself up. It's not adding any water to it. Well, it's the same depth, but relative to the land that it's that it's meeting, it would go up. Right? Well, yeah, yeah. But that's that's still like. But but he did concede that there is ice melt that is adding to the volume of water in the oceans, which is what's actually causing the water to rise. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, and it's funny. He's like, well, I didn't ask for you to prioritize one over the other or anything. I don't want your scientific yeah. opinion, really. I just want you to agree with me and give me some shit that I can give to my constituents and have you. On on the record as as agreeing with me that these things could also be contributing well, to it. It's just like that the the guy that was out on the uh where was he at? He was out on the east coast there someplace. That mayor of that small island town that was a climate change denier, but his 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 island is slowly going under the water because the water's rising. He says, mm-hmm. no, the water isn't rising. It's erosion. <laughs> like, no, literally. The water isn't the, rising. The land is sinking. Sink, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. Erosion would mean the island would get smaller from the sides. <laughs> like, like it's being chipped away. No, you're, you're going under the water. <laughs> like the mass is, the land mass is still there. It's just covered with water now. It didn't disappear. It didn't erode away. It's, and you people are stupid. Your, your island is, is being covered up. <laughs> You dumb fuck. Oh, GOP. You silly motherfuckers. <laughs> We've also got some news from the Satanic Temple, some of our wonderful friends yeah. over there. Uh, this comes to us from Jack Maturko, who's writing a blog out on Patheos now. We need to get Jack on the show. He's a yeah. great guy. It's a whole lot of fun. And when you show me his photograph, I'm like, I think I recognize him from other photos. Well, he looks very with- similar to you. True. Well, with the shiny, the it- shiny top portion of your... Oh. Of your body. So all of us bald people look alike. <laughs> I see how it is. All of you white bald people. <laughs> all, all us white bald people look all the same. Uh, uh, Jack writes for, for Patheos that last year the Satanic Temple, TST Arizona chapter, received local accolades and widespread community approval with its implementation of the Satanic Temple's Menstruating with Satan campaign. The campaign is a collection is a collection drive to accept donations of new menstrual products for the economically disadvantaged to be provided for free. Which is awesome because oh yeah, shit's expensive. Yeah, I'm glad that I don't have to deal with that myself. Yeah, for multiple reasons. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah, for several different reasons. Uh, the campaign uh, la, 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 to distribute these products, TST Arizona teamed with Southern Arizona's local YWCA in January of 2017. YWCA already had a previously existing project period initiative because such products are often left out of regular donations like clothes and food. TST Arizona even helped the YWCA construct a storage shed for the project. Which is awesome. Yeah, I can remember some of our friends posting about that. Yeah. That they'd been out working to build a shed to store products, for <laughs> to, to store menstruation products. Yeah, not goats for sacrifice because they don't do that. <laughs> the need for such programs are real, and unlike other so-called faith-based initiatives, the Satanic Temple's participation achieved its goal without any proselytizing. It did so with nothing but mi- but minimal private funding and the sweat equity of chapter members. 
It did so with great success. Yet the local directors of the YWCA's project period are being told they must, quote, dissolve our relationship, end quote, with TSTAZ and cannot accept the donations that the Satanists have spent almost three months collecting this year. Thanks to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> God damn it. Thanks to, as I understand it, a currently unidentified person who allegedly complained about satanic involvement both to the YWCA of Southern Arizona and to the YWCA's national organization offices in New York. So, I mean, it's, the only issue they have is the Satan side of it. Right. Yeah. You can't have, you can't have Satan touching the administration pads because you never know what evil curses they're going to put on them. It's just not good. Okay. Because Satan could touch those, and then the next thing you know, you got the fire crotch, and you're not even a redhead. Well, that would be a catastrophe. (laughs) Uh, Though a lot of attention got paid to Arizona's campaign, it's important to note that it is not just an Arizona initiative, and TSD's charity outreach drives include socks for Satan, warmer than hell, (laughs) clothing drives, and of course, most recently, TST's Santa Cruz's adoption of Seabright State Beach in California. TST's breed of Satanists actively try to participate in their communities, often successfully. The Arizona campaign was well-received this year, earning local magazine Phoenix New Times' Best Community Service Award for 2017. So this year, several participating businesses returned, as well as new entrepreneurs wishing to participate. In addition, TSTAZ took a page out of TST Seattle's playbook to expand the project's reach. When TST Seattle ran their Men's Straighten with Satan campaign, they innovated by setting up an Amazon wish list to take contributions from anyone who wanted to contribute but couldn't visit a drop-off location. Arizona's chapter thought that was a great idea and adopted it as well. The result? A local response that was even more successful than last year. Seriously, as a member of this chapter, I personally have five garbage bags full of menstrual products in my spare room waiting to be delivered on my next trip down to Tucson. Plus, there was a response from the internet that looked like this. And there's a picture of the, a whole uh, lot of boxes from Amazon delivered by the post office in these big carts. Yeah, like the one you'd see like in an old movie where they're just pushing it down the aisles. Yeah. Um, Jack writes that I take the time to explain all this, not because I want you to feel sympathy for TSTAZ. Don't worry about them. They're fine. They have already found another organization willing to accept the donations. It took them under five hours to arrange for the collected supplies to be donated to Go With The Flow instead. They're a resourceful bunch, and that Amazon wish list is still available, Internet. And there's a link there. That's actually a really smart thing to do. Cause, oh, hell yeah. I mean, it, you have no no excuse if you can't say, well, I was going to donate, but I just I, I don't have time to get over there. It's like, well, no, just jump on Amazon and hit. Yeah, you don't you don't have to do anything. You just order it and send yeah. it sends it there. You just pay for it. It's Done. awesome. Yeah. Uh whoever did this should be ashamed of themselves. Let's talk about the part where an unknown person allegedly professing to be Christian allegedly made a phone call to voice their religious objection to Satanists helping the needy. This person called one of the largest women's organizations in the country to try and put a stop to a popular, successful, award-winning religious public outreach campaign by going over the heads of organizers within the community. As Michelle Short, chapter head of TSTAZ, said in a press release, quote, It's disheartening that a local alliance bound by a shared motivation to help our community can be undone by distant corporate bureaucrats concerned more about upsetting unfounded prejudices than helping those in need. Our first priority in this campaign has been in bringing needed supplies to the disadvantaged, and we feel that the local brand of the YWCA shared in that goal as well. Unfortunately, the corporate offices seem to exhibit less altruistic concerns. We love Michelle. She's been on the show yeah, before also. Awesome person. I don't know who the person or people that made the complaint are, but I take no small bit of satisfaction in being able to report that whoever they are, their plan didn't work. TSTAZ simply found another group, one that is about to get a huge boost in donations. What the person or people responsible have done is to attempt and fail to deny material aid to needy people because they don't like Satanists. I have little doubt that this is the same kind of person who thinks they're being clever when they ask, quote, where are all the atheist hospitals? (laughs) To try and stop a beloved charity action because of a misguided dislike of those helping is despicable. To do so anonymously is cowardice 
and to watch your attempt fail so spectacularly is delightful. And I have to agree. Yeah. I mean, just like we love the fact that the Satanic Temple as a religious organization is doing Mm -hmm. awesome work. Oh, yeah. I'll also commend a Christian organization. Like, if you're doing actual good fucking work, Mm -hmm. I'm like, good on you. That's what you're supposed to be fucking doing. Mm -hmm. Not taking money to build new fucking temples just to get more money to pad your pockets. Oh, yeah. Well, and so I posted a a link to this out on Facebook and said, you know, I'm happy to work with any religious organization on – a common goal of helping people in need, it'd be great if religious people felt the same way. They're, yeah. But they're not. They're more interested in proselytizing and making sure that Jesus can see them doing good works and that they're not being tainted by those outside atheists or Satanists. Yeah. Well, it's like you mentioned earlier, I, like tomorrow I'm shooting video with this group that's called the Mascot Miracles Foundation. Yeah. They have a religious 501c3 filing. Mm-hmm. They do zero proselytizing. Good. There is no mention of Jesus. No, let's go pray about this. It's all about, hey, there are sick kids that we just want to give them a break. We want to help them people have some in need. Fun. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's make their dreams and their wishes come true. And it's not about any kind of religious thing, even though a lot of them are religious, mm-hmm. but that's, that has nothing to do with their religion. It's all about, let's just give these kids a good time. Good. So that's why I'm like, I've got no problem with helping you guys out because what you do, I honestly think is an awesome thing. Yeah. Hell yeah. So us atheists can coexist with a religious group that's doing (laughs) truly good things. Oh yeah. And if we're, and if we're working on a common goal to help other people, more's the better. Yeah. But religious people just, they don't want, they don't want Jesus to see that they might be working with the enemy. And they get stuck with the stigmatism of the name satanic. Yeah. In this case. Well, yeah, and they clearly don't have any idea what the satanic temple is or does. They just, they hear the word and they're like, no, well, we're out. They, they hear the word satanic and they don't even want to investigate or see, right. oh, well, they're they're not doing bad. I mean, there's stuff that I guarantee they would disagree with. Yeah. But at the same time, that the, the specific thing that they're attacking here, how can you disagree with that need Yeah. in a community? Yeah. So fuck that unknown person. Terrible, terrible, terrible. This is Phil Ferguson of the cleverly titled The Phil Ferguson Show, and thank God you're listening to The Godless Revolution. Science is like a blabbermouth who ruins a movie by telling you how it ends. Well, I say there are some things we don't want to know. Important things. If you have questions, comments, concerns, compliments, corrections, criticisms, or concepts for content, contact the show via email at godlessrevolution at gmail.com, by text or voicemail at 330-81-REBEL, or Twitter the twatter at TGR Podcast. Thank you! Uh, there is some good news on the f- science frontier. There's a new drug out uh, that's designed to help prevent migraines. What? I have several friends who suffer from migraines. Uh, my son, I don't... I don't think that he has them very often anymore if at all but for a while he was having really terrible migraines that luckily i've never had a migraine i did when i was younger yeah and i i can remember one time the doctor was saying well if you wanted it was i can't remember if it was like a shot to take to help against migraines but the thing was yeah you can do this it'll help get rid of your migraine but it might also make you feel tired and a little weaker also, your anus might fall off. That's kind of like, well, I can deal with. I mean, I, I can deal with them. It's just, you know, for for a few hours or a, a day, I might not want to open my burning eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but at least I don't have to feel the side effects twenty four seven, versus just having like once a month or once every two or three months having a nice migraine. So yeah, well, and I, I have several friends who get severe migraines pretty frequently and they're debilitating like uh you know they have to walk around with sunglasses and a hat all the time yeah and be in quiet dark areas for long periods of time and it's just excruciating pain i can't imagine having to live my life that way that's why like when i was younger i remember well even sometimes i still will get an occasional migraine it might be like once or twice a year now yeah but to where I'll I'll have my eyes closed where it feels like my eyes are on fire and I'll just take a wet cloth and put it over my eyes to help my face feel better. 
but also because even with my eyes closed, like it looks like a, like everything looks red. Yeah. When it should look dark. Yeah. And just that burning and the light sensitivity and just want to not move, just lay down and get into one position and don't move. Cause if I, like, I, if I move my head, it just feels like my brain is sloshing around and it hurts to just, oh, yeah. Move yeah. My I know head side to side. When my son has had them in the past, it's like, I would hate to disturb him because it was clear that even having to try to talk to me to tell me what was wrong was painful. Yeah. You know, he's just laying on his bed, curled up in a ball, like, Please just leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to have to deal with anything right now. Just go away. It'll be fine in a little while. Uh, but the new, uh, so the story comes to us from New York Times. It says the first medicine designed to prevent migraines was approved by the F, by the FDA on Thursday, ushering in what many experts believe will be a new era in treatment for people who suffer the most severe form of these headaches. The drug, Amovig, made by Amgen and Novartis, Oh, they just combine their names together. Isn't well, <laughs> and isn't Novartis the company who gave a whole lot of money to Michael Cohen? Was it? Well, there's a bunch. I'm pretty sure Novartis was one of them. Right. Uh, it's a monthly injection with a device similar to an insulin pen. The list price will be six thousand dollars, six hundred or six thousand nine hundred dollars a year. And Amgen said the drug will be available to patients within a week. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. Fortunately for most people, uh, the copay on that would be significantly less if they have insurance. If they don't have insurance, you're fucked. You're oh. fucked. I tell you, that's why we need socialized healthcare. Even with this eye surgery, the, the, the medicated drops I had to get that I got to do four times a day. Yeah. Even with my insurance, well, it was only, I, I had to pay for like 40 bucks. It was 38, 38 something. Mm -hmm. So right around $40 mm -hmm. for two. Little small vials. Tiny, teeny, teeny. Itty, and that was my copay. Itty, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's fucking ridiculous, man. Uh, I would much rather just pay, like, instead of paying for my health insurance through my company that then has to go to the insurance company to be doled out to the doctor, like, just fucking get rid of all of that. Take every bit of that that I'm paying toward my health insurance and Take that all in taxes yeah. and then just give me insurance where I don't have to worry about fucking co-pays and yeah. down payments and fucking, uh, what's the, your deductible, yeah. like all of that yeah. fucking bullshit. Just fucking get rid of it. We would save so much money if we didn't have to pay a bureaucracy who is trying to not give you any, any medical care because they want to save all of that money for themselves before passing it on to your doctor. Just fucking get rid of all yeah. of that shit. Have the, have the, have the government be able to just pay the doctors whatever they need well, but, as their regular, as their regular that, fees and, and get rid of all the fucking insurance bullshit. I don't have to worry about co-pays and deductibles and paying my insurance every, like just, Get rid of all that now, shit. Now, we know that would never work in any modern society, <laughs> yeah. especially the most industrialized societies on this earth. It would never work. Sure. Never. Yeah. Yeah. The EU, Canada, all those places with socialized health care, it's abysmal. They oh, yeah. hate it. Yeah. God, it's, a, it's, it drives me fucking nuts that people, the people here who need it, who don't have insurance are fighting against socialized healthcare because they've been so duped by lie to. the people on the right. Yeah. Like you would save money. Yeah. They don't, they don't, they don't think about it. Well, I, I don't get sick. You mean, you mean my taxes are going to go up? Yeah, but your healthcare expenses are going to go down, down, stupid ass. And guess what? But you, my taxes go up, right? No, I, I can't do that. That's but, not going to happen. But if you break your leg or have an injury or get into a car accident, guess what? When you leave that hospital, you don't owe them money. Yeah. And we still have some forms of socialized healthcare. I mean, really, when you think about it, if somebody can't afford uh, to Medicaid, go to the doctor, Medicaid. they go to the emergency room yeah. and then everybody's price goes up. So yeah. everybody ends up paying for it anyway. Stupid. Um, Amovig blocks a protein fragment, CGRP, that instigates and perpetuates migraines. Three other companies, Lilly, Teva, and Alder, have similar medicines in the final stages of study or awaiting FDA approval. The drugs will have a huge impact, said Dr. Amal Starling, a neurologist and migraine specialist at the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix. This is really an amazing time for my patient population and for general neurologists treating patients with migraine. I think this is awesome. Like yeah. I said, I have, I have a few friends who have migraines and 
I hope that they can get this drug and it will help them and, and improve life. Yay, fucking science and yeah. fuck you, God, for giving us migraines. I think the second <laughs> half of our show tonight is just yay science. Yeah. Yeah. Yay science and fuck off with all that God bothering shit. Uh, next up we have. Oh, this isn't yay science. This isn't yay science. This no. Is, it is not. This is you motherfuckers. Uh, this is, this is more get rid of the God bothering bullshit. Yeah. And it's a local story here in Utah. Um, but it's not a story unheard in other places. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. I mean, this is, yeah, this isn't an, a an, unique story. Yeah. This isn't a situation that is unique to Utah or Mormonism. We see this all over the place. Uh, this, and it's interesting that this also comes to us from the Deseret News, which is the owned. state's Mormon, oh, Mormon owned newspaper. Yeah. Uh, it says that the LDS Church, XMTC, which is the Missionary Training Center leader, asked to ask judge to dismiss a Colorado woman's sexual assault lawsuit. Salt Lake City, the LDS Church and a former Missionary Training Center president asked a federal judge in separate court filings Tuesday to dismiss a Colorado woman's lawsuit alleging the church leader raped her while she was a missionary there in early 1984. Both the church and Joseph L. Bishop say the statute of limitations on McKenna Denson's claims ran out years before she brought her allegations forward, which is fucking disgusting. Is. Why is there a statute of limitations on rape? There's no statute of limitations on murder, but yep. I guess, you know, rape is something that that happens to women much more than men, and we don't really fucking care about them, so let's put a limitation on oh. it because we all know that they're just going to complain about it later on down the road. We had a whole conversation with us at work, and one guy's like, well, why are these women waiting so long to come forward with these? Fuck you, and I'm like, asshole. Uh, what did he say after you punched him in the throat? <laughs> well, I'm like, I'm like, for one, I'm like, the woman in this case, because we we're talking about this one in particular. uh uh-huh has tried to bring it forward and has tried to bring it up, mm. but they won't listen to her. Mm. I said also a lot of women or anybody in general that has, I mean, it's, it's predominantly women that deal with sexual assault and rape. Yeah. They're afraid to come forward. Well, and this fucking guy, this Joseph L. Bishop has confessed yeah. to sexually molesting other women yeah. at the MTC while he was the president there. He's fucking confessed He's to that on, on tape. Yeah, on a on an audio recording. And I would imagine that he knows that he also raped this woman, but because it was so long ago, we should just forget about it because the statute of limitations has run out. Fuck that. Well, it was her that got him to confess. Oh, yeah? She's the one that, because she, so she showed up saying that she was doing interviewing people about the MTC. Mm-hmm. But what he didn't know was she was actually showing up to confront him about what she, what he had done to her in the past. Uh. So during the interview, she goes, do you know who I am? Do you remember me? And she says, do you remember taking me down into the basement where you had your special room, ripping my skirt off and trying to get into my, uh, grab my breast and tried to rape me, mm-hmm. but I got away. Mm-hmm. She's like, you groomed me because I had been molested by my father. And you groomed me to. All oh, right, right. They were, they were, she, not she, but somebody else released the tape of that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah. their conversation and him admitting that he did all of this. Well, cause it starts off with, he, he says, well, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. And, and he's kind of, you can, you can hear his demeanor change quite he's a bit. He's hemming and hawing. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize for what I did to you. He keeps apologizing. And then she asks him, have you, did you do this to any other women? He says, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I did. Several, yeah. apparently. But then he's like, oh, God, I wonder what else I've forgotten that I did when I was doing it. Because he's 80 years old, so I don't know if there is a... Well, he's probably tried pretty hard to forget. Forget. But, but I wonder if there is actually neurological issues with him where he might have actually... He can't remember. Yeah. Which, being 80, you got to give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt with the having memory loss. But still... He knows what he did was wrong. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, he and he said, I, I listened to the tape, and it seems like he said something like, uh, you know, he's he's worked to try to make amends 
Uh, yeah, by and what? That, and Praying other to his heavenly the, father? Yeah, and the other people in the church have approached him about this. And, yeah, because she came forward with the allegations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the story continues. It says, quote, the purpose of statutes of limitations is clear. They are legislative expressions of public policy that encourage potential plaintiffs to bring their actions promptly before the cause, before the causes get stale from lost evidence or faulty memories. Oh, but, but murder, I can, I could kill someone and a hundred years from now I can be convicted of it. Mm -hmm. Ah. Well, this is according to Bishop's lawyer, Andrew yeah. Dice. Yeah. Quote, here, Ms. Denson waited decades to bring the causes of action in the complaint, and they are time-barred as a result. LDS Church Attorney, that was the end of the quote. I find this to be amazing right here. Yeah. LDS Church Attorney David Jordan contends Denson's assault claim expired in early 1985, one year after the alleged rape, and her emotional distress claims expired in early 1988. So, the statute of limitation... <laughs> To be convicted of a rape is one Is one year. fucking year? God damn Which it. I know is wrong. That's fucking... I actually thought it was closer to 15 years, which still isn't enough. Yeah, that's fucking terrible. Quote, thus, any claim Ms. Denson may have, ex may have expired over 30 years ago and should be dismissed, he wrote. Because they know he's fucking guilty. Yeah. It's, yeah, they're not, they're not making any, any case to say, well, no, he didn't do this. It's just... Oh, he might have, but you know what? Time's up, lady. Yeah. You should have reported this earlier. Too Which, bad, so sad. Fuck you. Denson, 55, of Pueblo, Colorado, sued Bishop 85 of Chandler, Arizona, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints last month in U.S. District Court for sexual assault and battery, negligent and intentional infliction of emotional distress, fraud, fraudulent nondisclosure, and fraudulent concealment. And this is all part of what we, we've talked about this on a previous episode where the LDS Church, uh, was backing legislation where you could not, uh, you, where you couldn't, uh, you, you use couldn't go recordings. After the, you couldn't record somebody unless there was, uh, you know, unless well, all parties agreed to being recorded. We know the legal side of that. Only one party needs to be. Yeah. And known. so currently in Utah, you only need one party consent to record conversations. Yeah. And the LDS church was backing legislation to change that so that you would need. Uh, multiple party consent or all party consent because they knew that this kind of evidence of Bishop admitting to molesting and potentially raping young girls at the MTC was out there and they wanted to be able to use this legislation to block that from coming to light. So fuck the LDS well, church, fuck Mike Bishop and fuck his attorneys for doing all this I, shit. Too. I thought you were going to bring up how they're, they're, they were trying to block legislation to make it so that the statute of limitation was longer. For cases of rape or molestation. Did they try to do that also? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, it, and, it, and they succeeded. Yeah. Remember, I think it was last year they tried to to raise the... To extend, to the, extend statute of limitations. the statute of limitations. And they were fighting to block it. That's fucking and, despicable. And, and they succeeded. Despicable. Um, Let's see. Dens, I already read that. Bishop has denied the allegations. The suit asks for a jury trial seeking damages for loss of earnings and to pay for medical and legal expenses. It also asks that a jury direct the church to change its policies. None of these things seem terribly bad, harmful to the church, right? No. Like, it would protect other people. It's going to help make this woman whole for her lost earnings and to pay for her medical care over yeah. this time. She's not asking for a huge, it doesn't, I mean, at least from this, even in the church-owned newspaper, it doesn't sound like she's seeking a huge punitive no. damage or anything. Not she just wants to have her medical bills paid and for the church to change its policies yeah. so the assholes like this can't fucking make victims of these young women who are yeah. coming through the missionary training center. In the so future. they're removed from those positions and legally prosecuted. Yeah. Denson claims Bishop is a lifelong sexual predator and that he confessed as much in, uh, to his ecclesiastical leader in the late 1970s. In 1984, the statute of limitations for rape in Utah was four years. The suit, however, claims the statute of limitations for fraud has not run out because Denson first learned the church had taken no action against Bishop in December 2017. The lawsuit claims Denson made 10 reports about Bishop to various LDS leaders over the years without learning if any action had been taken against him. Jordan wrote that Denson appears to contend in her lawsuit that although... <coughs> Jeez, you're dying again. God damn it, sorry. That although she discovered the bishop was not a, quote, safe, honorable, and trustworthy person in 1984, she did not discover until December 2017 that the church 
knew he was a sexual predator at the time he was placed in a leadership position at the MTC. In short, even assuming Ms. Denson's allegations are true, she knew by at least early 1984 that, contrary to any alleged representation by the church, Mr. Bishop was not safe, honorable, and trustworthy, he wrote. Accordingly, the three-year statute of limitations for her fraud claim began to run at that time. Thus, Miss Denson's fraud claims expired in early 1987, over 30 years ago. Wait, didn't we read earlier that fraud claims don't expire? I don't know. Maybe? It said at that time it was four years for... Oh, well, no, it was... So. So she was saying that she didn't know that the fraud had happened because she didn't learn about it until December 2017. Yeah. So the statute of limitations wouldn't have run out on that because she didn't even know about it until yeah. December 2017. Yeah. So she still got the three or four years or whatever okay. after that time. Uh, Denson posed as a reporter last December to confront Bishop, who served as MTC president from 1983 to 1986 and as president of Weber State College in the 1970s. Her, allega- her allegations became public when a website released their taped conversation and its 76-page transcript. Yeah, you can actually find it online if you look his name up and, and go to YouTube. Yeah, well, and if you go, there's a, a what is it? The there's, whole conversation is like an hour and a half long. There's uh, Mormon Leaks. There's yeah. a Mormon Leaks website where yeah. they have all this information. Um, what is What is just fucking gross about this whole fucking thing is that the church and the attorneys aren't saying that he didn't do these things. It's that they're she, saying they're, they're not even addressing that. It's just, Oh, well, he may have, but you know what? Time's up. She should have reported this sooner. Well, it, it did say that he's claiming he didn't do it, which we know is false because he, because he admitted to tape. it on the tapes. But yeah, they're not going after, well, he's, he's innocent. Yeah. They're his attorneys after, aren't no, presenting that. They're just saying her time ran up. out. Yeah. That's fucking despicable. Yeah. That's gross. That's that that's fucking disgusting that they're like, oh, well, he may have raped you, but you know what? You should report it a little while ago. Too late. That's that just is fucking terrible. Uh, But that'll do it for us this evening. Before we leave, I want to make sure that we thank our Patreon supporters to whom this show will be sent out before the rest of the normies. (laughs) We won't have an extra Patreon portion. I'm sorry, but. I'm not feeling great, and I got other shit to do. Ryan's got other stuff to do. Uh, yeah, I'm tired, not feeling well, and super busy. But I appreciate all of you so much, and I want—I especially appreciate our Patreon supporters. That would be Vanessa, Robato, Michelle Short, Christy Kalbach. We talked about Michelle earlier. That's yeah, we nice. did. Hey, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Uh, Newmania, Alan Firth, Gaytheist, Larry Wilson, Doctor Dan Matt's boss from the Two SC Podcast, to whom we pledge loyalty. Let the meet Kofefe. Steven Andrus. Jeff Peterson. Janet Yutter. Marius Kot Butrakowski. Utah Outcasts. Tim Jacobson. Matt Tuller. Megan Kennedy. Andrew Vodapich. Brandy Hamrick. Jeremy Goodson. Angelica Pearson. Wes Aaron. Savita Kuna. Purple Dragon. And Taylor Grin. Who is doing some really exciting important stuff here coming up, man. I, I chatted with him online a bit today. Uh, nice. Before I talk about it though i should make sure that it's okay with him that i say anything about it but i was really excited for him it's it's, i'll tell you about it okay (laughs) fine but but yeah it's super cool stuff man it it sounds exciting and fun and awesome i'm 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 a wee bit envious of the things (laughs) that he'll be doing here shortly (laughs) but uh thank you all very much for listening and so until next week crucify those bishops leave a review to achieve 2020 vision and write the show five times a day toward Philadelphia? Why not? Okay. <laughs> Feel free to introduce yourself however you want. Usually the way it works is people say like, hi, this is Mandisa Thomas. Um, well, they don't I'm... always say that name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was fantastic. Can we get another take because we weren't recording? <laughs> <laughs> It was still set up for the Zencaster where we don't record your audio onto our feed on the computer itself. I was like, wait. I'm like, that's flatlining. That's not picking up anything.